Hi, and thanks for joining us for another installment of Women at Iowa. I'm your host for today, Erin Tysman. Our guest this afternoon is Chief Curator for the University of Iowa Museum of Art, Kathleen Edwards. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Erin. Um, so I thought we'd talk a little bit about today. Your background now, you've got your bachelor's degree at the University of Richmond in Virginia, right. and you spent some time in Philadelphia at the Print Center. Can you tell us a little bit about that and what sure. led you to Iowa? Sure, I will. Um, I was the director of the Print Center in Philadelphia for almost nine years, and the Print Center, um, in fact, I probably have some images here, was, uh, is, a nonprofit organization that focuses on uh, emerging artists. Oh, and I was able, um, through my experience there, to learn about curating exhibitions and also help um, a lot of young artists kick off their careers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was also uh, uh, an organization that um, had been founded in 1915, so it had quite uh, a long history. Let's see, I will find wow, some okay, installation great. shots of some of the shows I did here. On the left is an installation by the artist Adele Henderson, great. and on the right uh, an installation by Connie Coleman. So um, my interests have been or began uh, with the idea of providing artists um, the space and the resources mm -hmm. to oftentimes take a leap in, in their work in terms of exhibiting or experimenting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I did that um, and, and curated over 75 ex exhibitions there. Uh, also did, uh, oops, that's not right, um, a number of other programs. So you did bring, you brought some of that print experience to the University of Iowa. You worked with prints and photography um, in, as a curator in that exhibit as well. Can you share a little bit about that? I was hired uh, in 98 um, to be the curator of prints, drawings, and photographs. And uh, at that time, um, I focused on bringing new artworks into the collection um, through gift uh, or purchase. Here's an example of a couple of acquisitions. On the left, uh, a drawing by Ernest Fried, who is an alum, and then on the right, a watercolor by James Lachey, Great. who was a professor of painting. Uh, here, a photograph by Hans Breder, who's a professor emeritus, mm -hmm. and Miriam Shapiro, who is an alum. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, uh, has been um, part of my responsibility in terms of that job. But then that, uh, after about six years, changed. And I became the curator of European and American art. Mm -hmm. And so my responsibilities broadened. Uh, and then I think I've been chief curator for two, about two years now. Okay, and for those that don't know, what, what do you do as chief curator? What does your job responsibilities include? Um, well, you work with a team. Um, you, you don't really work on your own as, as kind of a single scholar, let's say, but you're working uh, with many other people on the museum staff. Primarily, um, I work with the acquisitions, so oftentimes with collectors who are thinking of giving their art to mm -hmm. the museum mm -hmm. collection, and I get to know them, and oftentimes even can um, advise them, um, because that ultimately benefits the museum mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. university. Uh, and then um, deciding about what artworks to buy with the little acquisitions funds that we have. Mm -hmm. um, I also organize exhibitions, which means that from both the permanent collection and um, for exhibitions where we're bringing in artwork outside the permanent collection. I propose exhibitions. I select the artwork that's going to be in it. Oh, great. I write the label copy or the gallery guide um, and uh, work with um, people to um, make known that the exhibition's happening, mm -hmm. um, and it's kind of a you know a team process. It usually takes for a major exhibition about three years. And there are several exhibitions coming up that we had discussed um, before we got on camera here. And there's also one in 2010 called the Feminist Art Project, which is um, kind of an all-encompassing, very large-scale thing. Can you share a little bit about the exhibitions coming around the corner? Sure. Um, 
The exhibition um, that you mentioned having to do with feminism, it's actually a show called Lil Picard and Counterculture New York. Oh, wow. And Lil Picard was a German artist who was forced to immigrate from Berlin to New York in 1937 because she was Jewish. And she was a writer and an artist, oh, wow. and a, uh, she made jewelry. She owned a hat shop on 57th Street. She was a performance artist. She was a member of Andy Warhol's factory. She made incredible collages and installations. She went to every opening, every party, mm -hmm. um, and she was a little bit older than um, sort of the New York school uh, mm -hmm. at that time. But uh, the university has her artwork um, that she left in her estate when she died and her archive. And so I'm organizing an exhibition of that oh, with wow. a catalog and it will go to the Gray Art Gallery at NYU. Oh, that's incredible. So it's really exciting. I think, um, I think students and people who are interested in the 60s mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. will really um, love it. And the show that um, you spoke about that's happening as a result of the flood um, at the Figgy Museum. Oh, yes, I've yes. organized that, and that opens on April 19th. Oh, great. And it's called A Legacy for Iowa, Pollock's Mural and Modern Masterworks from the University of Iowa Museum of Art. Great. And it's 22 paintings, including Jackson Pollock's mural. Oh, great, great. How does it feel, and I'll kind of, we'll get into this, um, but how does it feel to have that art back in the figgy and have it back on Iowa soil. I know that's been very, very important to everyone at the UIMA. Um, and, I, and I hope important to the broader community mm -hmm. too. I mean, it's, it's our art museum. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, it was quite a um, kind of um, tense uh, moment mm -hmm. um, as about 14 um, art movers moved the painting up the marble stairway in the Figgy Museum mm -hmm. to where it's hanging, um, uh, but it it worked. We weren't sure whether or not it would actually work, uh, and it did. Um, and then seeing as they brought in the rest of these major paintings, it includes our Max Beckman triptych, mm -hmm. our, our Robert Motherwell painting, mm -hmm. which is a very large painting. And, uh, and then seeing them hung on the walls. It's a beautiful museum. It's only three years old. And it's wonderful that uh, we were able to collaborate because it's good for them and good for us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And seeing them on the wall, it was so exciting. I think people were just grinning ear to ear. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great. That's great. It's gotten a lot of coverage in the Quad Cities in here. So I, th I think it's going to attract I a lot of people, which is I great. I hope so. Yeah. Which is great. Yeah. Well, and just to mention that, that faculty and students um, get in free. Mm -hmm. so. Which is fantastic, <laughs> too. That helps. Um, now, a little bit, uh, I, we had talked, we had Dale Fisher on our program recently, and he was talking about the Ritchie Ballroom at the IMU being a possible place for some smaller collections. Um, now, what kind of process is being done in collaboration with buildings that are here on campus for, for your collection? Well, it's been UI. a really long process since the flood. Um, art museums function under um, you know certain professional standards. Mm -hmm. uh, we make uh, agreements with donors um, who give their art that it will be cared for. And in order to do that, the temperature has to be a certain, within a certain range of humidity, the lighting, there has to be security, and you have to get an insurance mm -hmm. company to agree to insure it. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, they won't do that unless you meet all of these, these standards. Um, so there is a real, um, you know, a field of, of making sure that all these criteria are met. And so, as you can imagine, with all of the people affected by the flood at the university um, and all the buildings, uh, it was a real challenge to find a place that could um, meet those criteria. Um, and Pam White, the interim director, um, just was pretty tenacious at, at, at keeping up the search and ended up with this arrangement with the Figgy where our collection will be stored there mm -hmm. temporarily and we'll also have a gallery all the time with something in it from our collection and then another gallery in that space with periodic exhibitions. And she um, was able to find some spaces in the Union and it's really through David Grady who mm -hmm. runs 
uh, the union, he was just very, very open to the Great. museum coming in there. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. And it'll be nice to have it, you know, obviously contained on our campus and absolutely. have that feeling back. Now, in relation to, obviously, the art at the University of Iowa Museums, you have some um, images here of, um, I believe, one of the first images I saw was Elizabeth Catlett, who yeah. actually went to school here for a while. Yes, she did. And um, it lives in Mexico currently, is that She correct? lives in Cuernavaca in, and in New York. And... Um, uh, on the right, you see a linoleum block print by um, Catlett named, uh, titled Sharecropper. And when I came to the university um, and was in charge of the print collection, I couldn't believe that the, the museum did not have an Elizabeth Catlett in its collection, mm -hmm. um, not even to mention that she's an alum, but she's such an important American printmaker, mm -hmm. um, that we um, raised funds to purchase this print on the right. Great. Uh, and then I had an opportunity to um, visit people I think at the foundation had been in contact with um, Mrs. Catlett and I was able to go to Cuernavaca oh, wow. uh, to stay with her and this is uh, her studio oh, wow. with some of her sculpture for four nights and I was given um, the task um, to choose prints from her own personal collection of her oh own work goodness. to purchase That's incredible. for the collection. And um, her studio is right out this courtyard, sort of to the left, uh, her print studio. And um, I just spent two days there, and I actually organized her flat files, which is where her artworks were stored for her, because oh, they were a mess. Oh, wow. um, but I selected, I believe, 23 reprints for the collection. Here's another view of her studio. Oh, that's incredible. And here um, she is, uh, here are also two linoleum blocks here that she's drawn on and she's in the process of carving. And um, as a result, we have this wonderful collection of Elizabeth Catlett prints and um, also the sculpture down in the Union mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. new foyer uh, or entryway um, called Stepping Out, and that's an art in, in state buildings piece. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it was it was a great experience. I got to know her really well, and we had knew a lot of people in common. And it's you know up in the top three uh, experiences that I've had oh, here that's in incredible. Iowa. That's incredible. Uh, so what was it like, I mean, talking with her, it must have been absolutely inspiring to see her. She's such, got such a long history of, of art and, and production. Well, what was really uh, interesting to find out about, obviously, was her years here in Iowa. Um, and there isn't, you know, a lot of archival material mm -hmm. about that time period, um, but she she certainly had a lot of um, stories, but she studied with Grant Wood. Mm -hmm, and it was mm -hmm. right around the time that the School of Art was thinking about getting away from realism, mm -hmm. kind of regionalism and realism, into more of the avant-garde abstraction mm -hmm. that was going on. Catlett graduated with an MFA, the first MFA in sculpture oh, wow. in 1941. And just keep in mind that it wasn't that many years later that Jackson Pollock painted the mural. mural. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there was a faculty member who had come in or was just about to come in, Philip Gustin, who he painted in a regionalist style, but he was starting to bring in surrealism and some other mm -hmm, mm -hmm. abstract um, orientations. And Catlett was very much committed to Grant Wood. And he always told her, paint what you know. Mm -hmm. You know, make art about what you know. Oh, great. And so she did. And she, you know, continued to do this even though um, at times there was quite a lot of pressure to be modern and abstract, mm -hmm. but she never gave that up. And the reason why she went to Mexico was because she wanted to study at the Talier de Grafica Popular, which is a very well-known Mex Mexican city collaborative print shop where they oh, made neat. prints really initially to kind of help 
uh, the indigenous peoples mm -hmm. um, get hooked into educational opportunities and um, offer them more resources. Oh, so it's a very um, change the world through art kind of um, value that mm -hmm. she has and continues. And she, to yes, have. and she clearly does. I mean, her art is absolutely incredible. And, and it's a little bit, you know, for the time period, being a woman, an African American woman, coming in and, and, and going to school and getting her MFA and doing art, what an incredible groundbreaking thing to, to go through. And, to, and you know, in, that, in, in terms of the time period. Well, I think um, she was, you know, living in separate quarters here. I mean, there, there wasn't um, um, a lot of support, but there was enough, mm -hmm. and it was inexpensive to go to school here. Um, she was able to take engineering classes at oh, Ames, wow. so she learned, she taught herself how to build armatures and how to sort of deal with sculpture um, and went then from, uh, from here to Chicago, and was very involved in the sort of the, renaissance, the artistic mm -hmm. renaissance that mm -hmm. went on there after the war. Um, and again, she just very much wanted to, to be involved in using art to support people mm -hmm. and certainly African-American women and children um, was always you know, her, her theme, her, her subject. subject. Yeah, that's incredible. Now, what other images do you have here? I see you have, I mean, there's several well, I, I've, from the I've collection. Well, I've brought uh, some images of, of artworks that the Art Museum acquired while mm -hmm. I was curator. On the left, it's quite a large print, real mixed media, collage elements. It's hard to see in this not too great ter uh, uh, digital image, but by Frank Stella. And then a wonderful uh, screen print by uh, Sigmar Poco, which kind of speaks to, and what we often try to do in purchasing work, speak to not only um, trends in the print world, um, but also in the academic world at mm -hmm. Iowa, mm -hmm. um, and sort of speaking to um, film theory, et cetera, mm -hmm. with this polka, uh, with different techniques and printmaking, this Kiki Smith, this is a woodcut, um, and it's this head, the skeleton shape is sort of stuck in a cut, and then these are her fingerprints oh, in different colors wow. here. And Raymond Pettibon, um, this, is, this is just kind of a comic-oriented work. Lee Bontico, who was a, a wonderful um, 60s, artist, minimalist artist, and this is a very large William Kentridge print, and he's also a filmmaker, South mm -hmm. African filmmaker, mm -hmm. so trying to kind of address globally um, what artists are doing in print, but then also relating uh, through, um, you know, Western history of prints back to um, early printmaking because our painting collection is primarily modern mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. and primarily 20th century. Um, and so in order to meet the needs of the faculty, um, our, it's our print collection that really goes back as far as late 15th century. Oh, wow. So we That's have incredible. a Canaletto print here on the left, which is a, a view of Venice and then a Turner uh, print of a, a view in uh, England, um, and again, some more recent acquisitions, a Paul Clay print from um, the 30s, a lithograph called Balancing oh, that's Act. That's incredible. To yeah. um, uh, Albrecht Durer print um, called The Canon from uh, 1518, which is uh, etching on copper, and he only did I think five, three to five mm -hmm. etchings on copper. He mm -hmm. was mostly an engraver. So you can talk about the history of Nuremberg, which this sort of um, illustrates um, this particular image, and often would have you know German cultural history classes coming in and all of that. So the the collection itself. Um, and also really classic photography, Gary Winogrand mm -hmm. on the left, mm -hmm. um, and, and Harry Callahan on the right. A recent uh, acquisition, these are small drawings, uh, you know, with paint and, and uh, ink by Jim Shrosbury, who's a, a faculty at the Maharishi University in oh. Fairfield, so he's a local artist, a wonderful artist. 
Um, and some things that some people probably have seen, um, an installation I did in the museum called Marketplace. And um, there's a, an artist on the faculty, his name is John Fryer. And he did a project called allmylifeforsale.com. And what he did was he sold um, all of his artwork online on eBay. Or this is now, I think, it's got to be four, four or five years ago. So this was early on mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. eBay. And um, he created an art project from it and, and traveled around the country, uh, corresponded with the people who won his objects on eBay. You know, he auctioned them. And I actually, for the museum, bought his false teeth. Oh, for wow. $25. Wow. <laughs> then he corresponded with these people and then he visited them. One summer, he got he bought an ambulance, an old ambulance and drove around the country visiting them and he documented that, published the whole thing in a book. So it was kind of this whole conceptual project. Neat. So the museum bought not only his false teeth, but the very last thing that he put up at auction was his earl allmylifeforsale.com, which we bought. Oh, wow. So we have to pay to keep that address viable. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I think the contract is for 10 years. So we actually, I mean, we do have, in terms of what we own, it's, it's a really interesting discourse mm -hmm, about mm -hmm. what art is. What we actually, we own these false teeth. <laughs> and we own this Earl, which is virtual, but it speaks to a history of conceptual arts. This piece by Jonathan Seliger on the left, uh, it's actually all done by hand. It looks like a gap bag, but it's canvas folded and painted. Oh my goodness. It's not real. It's a complete replica. That's incredible. And I, then another project amazing. that John Fryer did um, was also kind of an internet conceptual project. He bought on eBay this big boy. Um, big boy burger. Burger yeah. <laughs> statue. And, and then the museum bought that from him. Oh, wow. And so, again, this kind of ownership issues and authorship issues mm -hmm. in terms of kind of theories of, 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 of art um, and, it's kind and what of, art can be. It's kind of spanning. You know, you mentioned now that you have this virtual ownership. So it's kind of, uh, it's amazing how art has broadened itself over time and kind of, in, and as it grows, and, and now, especially with the, internet and all the different ways people can access it. Um, I know that the UIMA has a blog and it kind of blogs kind of upcoming events. It had blogs during the flood and so it's kind of an interesting outreach to other generations that are becoming more familiar with growing up on computers. I think and it's um, interestingly enough though the university has a number of collections on campus that speak to these conceptualist arts or these kind of arts that try to break rules. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an incredible Dada collection in the main library and a, a Fluxus collection and special collections. So this uh, idea that artists break boundaries can be traced through the even the Jackson Pollock painting mm -hmm, is mm -hmm. kind of about that. It's about innovation, experimentation, breaking rules. Mm -hmm. um, and so you, you see that kind of current theme mm -hmm. going through a lot of the Western, at least the Western art collections. So. Which is really, it's just really incredible. I'll show you another piece that, that sort of breaks some rules. This was a, oh, a interesting. <laughs> <laughs> an installation um, by a Taiwanese artist named E. Chen. Um, and what he did was we gave him and we gave him ten thousand dollars and he had to get himself here um, and during that time this he pr had a proposal um, he went around to places like Walmart and Paul's and he bought all all of these things and then he went back to he, he rented a room at the travel lodge and he'd go and he open up the boxes, turn them inside out, so unpack everything that was in them, turn them inside out, and then cut these openings, these, he called them apertures or openings, repack what was in them. So it was everything, and it, it was kind of like, sort of, you know, camping, and there were duck decoys mm -hmm. in there, mm -hmm. and, and um, you know, horse feeders, and various things like that, uh, and, and then construct this, piece in the sculpture court and you could walk under this tent and, 
and, and stick your head up in here and oh. it was all lit in there. And then if you were walking up on the right side here, there were these televisions that were facing up on static with static on them. And, so this is um, cardboard here, these, these boxes? It's, are, the it's all actual, cardboard boxes. It, yeah, turned inside out. And so he's also speaking to, um, you know, the, the kind of um, capitalist revolution mm -hmm. in China mm -hmm. and the whole um, kind of idea about marketplace. So what was in marketplace, this installation, was Big Boy, the Gap Bag, this E. Chen piece, and John Fryer's false teeth, and then he was also, as he was traveling around the country, he was interviewed on all the, Jay Leno, mm -hmm. and all the late night shows, so that we played those tapes back, uh, oh, and had neat. his book there, yeah. and all of that. So it was, uh, it was I mean, a great I, project. I've read up, I mean, I've seen several people blog about this particular exhibition. Oh, you have? Yes, and people were, very awesome reviews of, from the people that have visited. I mean, it was, some people were artists themselves, but many were just, people traveling through, the, through Iowa City and stopped at the UIMA and saw this marketplace and they were just enthralled with the kind of creativity that came out of it. Yeah, I really, um, I enjoyed that. That was, um, that was a great, a great, great project. I really, really liked it. Um, let's see, I was gonna look for another image of a installation. Um, I did a large show called, uh, at the museum, called Acting Out, Invented Melodrama in Contemporary Photography, um, which traveled, and um, this was a really wonderful project. There's uh, been kind of, a, it's a little bit over now, but mm -hmm. um, I would say in the early, you know, 2000s, uh, even in the in 19, last decade of the 20th century, there were photographers who were, who were setting up their photographs, um, and I was speaking to, you know, what signals for us that a drama is taking place, so my catalog had to do with, uh, went back to all of those kinds of cues within the history of photography, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and really enjoyed that. John Fryer, just to, I wasn't planning on talking about John, <laughs> but I find myself doing that, invited me to talked to his class this last semester, oh, and cool. he had them uh, break into two teams, and they uh, each had the project to do a stage photograph. They're both hanging in Studio Arts right now. Oh, neat. And one um, is, the scenario is, um, there's a young woman who is dressed in candy. It's called, the, the title I think is called Eye Candy. It's in a mall and they've got a mom and like a 11 year old girl and the 11 year old girl is sort of pulling away from the mom towards this woman is sort of like the metaphor of growing up too soon mm -hmm. and then there are a bunch of guys kind of sort of ogling her and it's all so digitally manipulated so if you look at the you know it's in the mall but then you realize there are no signs on the stores <laughs> ever you know and then the other group did this whole sort of very different piece where they, they were mostly um, uh, women in the class and they all dressed up like they were, gonna, they were in a beauty pageant with gowns and sashes, but they digitally manipulated their faces so they looked like, kind of like monsters. Oh, no. And then they had their professor, John Fryer, dress up like an MC. And then the sashes have kind of like a natural history kind of feel to them. It's very interesting. So wow. that just happened. And that, I, was, I was really impressed. I was just so impressed. Isn't that incredible so, to see how students I know. You know, take an idea they and they, really, it just evolves? Yeah, students really love this show. There was a lot going on. I really liked That's it. That's really interesting. I really liked it. And I know, um, I, I noticed too, and this was, I don't remember if this was, this must have been fall of 07 that there was an, a, a piece at the UIMA and it was videos and there were celebrities involved. I don't remember what it was. The Robert Wilson? Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, Voom. Yes, Voom, Voom there portraits. we go, okay. I, yeah, 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 that was yeah. incredible too. Oh, wow, I mean, from our end, we had to take down the entire collection, you know, so it was a really hard job to do that. Mm -hmm. But what an incredible transformation of mm -hmm. that space. Mm -hmm. 
Robert Wilson was um, actually a visiting artist here at Iowa in the 70s. Oh, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. In theater. Um, that's really his background and uh, in kind of minimalist theater. And he had created these, um, these portraits. And um, it was through the contact with his, he has a foundation now, um, that we were able to convince him th really through, I think, his relationship with the university, his feelings about the university, that he came, he agreed to lend these and we were able to um, install them as an exhibition. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That was a really incredible it show. Was. And really incredible show. Yeah. So it must yeah. have been neat. We're really to... glad that we got all of that down before mm -hmm. the flood because oh, I just yeah. can't, although it may have been easier to get those things out. But mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, I think that's the last really big show we did. Mm -hmm. um, I think, I believe it closed. You're saying it was in 2007. I'm I, I want to say it was the, near the end of 2007. I don't remember yeah, exactly either. I can't either. But it was an incredible show. It I was. know that. Um, do you have? I, I was well, curious uh, about some yeah, of these other. Let's see. Yes, like these slides yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. This is uh, on the left. We renovated uh, the north end of that building um, for temporary exhibitions, and the first one that we hosted was. Um, from the collection of the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis, and it was a traveling show. They were renovating, or they mm -hmm. were building a, a new building, and it was called American Tableau. And so this was the first show that we did in our newly renovated space. Um, but it, was, it started out with one of George Siegel's pieces. You know, oh, George, George Siegel, Siegel does the... Kind of the lifelike sculpture work. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, the, the cast figures, kind mm -hmm. of paper mache looking figures. Mm -hmm. It was called Diner. Oh, okay. Uh, do you, I don't know yeah. if you can picture that, um, but that is in the Walker Art Center's collection. So it started out with sort of earlier American modernist work, and then it, it kind of ended up with more contemporary artists. And uh, the, the show on the right was called Picturing Eden, and uh, it was a show that we borrowed from the George Eastman uh, mm -hmm. House Museum in oh, Rochester. Neat. And it had a guest curator who um, identified works uh, that all had to do with the concept of Eden. It was a, a contemporary photography show and also a great show, as mm -hmm. was American Tableau, for cross-disciplinary involvement of the faculty and the students at the university, as well as being just really wonderful shows for the public. Mm -hmm. Um, something that I w wanted to ask about too, um, Dale Fisher was on recently and he was talking about kind of bringing in ceramics and three-dimensional art and how it's kind of an opportunity for visitors to the museum to feel and touch and, and kind of see the process. Because even in photographs and, and two-dimensional paintings, it's kind of hard to see the thought that went into it. You know, I know on the UIMA website you can read about Jackson Pollock's mural and there talks, they talk, he talks about, there's a quote in there about how he went about it and how he goes about his work. But to see ceramics and to be able to touch them, it's kind of a different experience for people that are viewing art. What, what do you feel about that? Is it kind of in that same realm? Well, we are going ahead with the, um, this Ritchie Ballroom project. Um, it's gonna be renovated for the museum. Um, we hope to have it open by the time classes start in the fall. Um, and we see it as uh, primarily for use by university students, mm -hmm. although it'll be it'll have public hours. But one component of that space, which is going to be really full with kind of an international overview of our collections. Mm -hmm. um, so it's going to be ancient art, uh, Native American, Mesoamerican, Chinese pottery, um, Japanese prints, uh, and it will have some small little galleries which will play up on kind of our strengths. Mm -hmm. it, with, within the space there will be um, some African art, some conceptual art as I was describing here. Um, it'll have a, a group of paintings, um, but we have a cap on what our insurance covers for that mm -hmm. space. Mm -hmm. So for example, Mural can never go in that space. Mm -hmm. um, and um, we'll also have a classroom, um, which will have two walls made of glass. So it'll be, it's kind of built on the model of this hands-on classroom that was in the ceramics gallery mm -hmm. that was at the art museum. Mm -hmm. um, 
but it's going to serve not only ceramics, but also African art and works okay. on paper. And you'll be, as of, let's say you're coming just to even look at something for a paper. Well, if a class has an appointment in the classroom, you'll be able to see them in the classroom oh, uh, and the works that'll be on the um, uh, walls of the gallery will be open, the shelves will be open from the inside. So those wor works that will be on the shelves will be accessible by the, the teacher um, to take off the shelf, you know, to bring on the table. Oh. And, for, and for some of them, students will be able to handle them. Oh, wow. Well, that'll be a really great experience then. Um, and I'm, this kind of just leads me into this next topic that's widely discussed, I'm sure. Um, what has this whole process been like? I, I, and it's not easy to sum up, I'm sure, but what has it been like for you emotionally and for your team? And kind of this, Dale had mentioned when he was here, kind of this community feel that really came together when it came down to, wow, we really have to save these pieces of art. We really have to do what we can. Let's make this work. And now you're, now these other opportunities are opening with the Figgy and now with the Ritchie Ballroom. So what has this kind of transition been like? Well, it's interesting. There's a, a visitor on campus now. His name is David Houston, and he's a curator of a museum in New Orleans. And the reason why he's here is to talk to art history students about the approach that his museum took after Katrina. And at dinner last night, one of the questions I asked him was, okay, um, when did you decide it was over? Because I'm ready for it to be over. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he said, um, about a year. So that in their materials online, they weren't talking about the hurricane anymore. I mean, they were, obviously, mm -hmm. they, they were in much, much worse shape mm -hmm. than we were. They lost collections. Uh, some of their, their staffs, them, their families, their neighborhoods were also completely mm -hmm. destroyed. Um, you know, they didn't know, people didn't know where people were. I mean, it was so much more of a tragedy than our flood was, but um, that's how I'm feeling now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm really ready and looking forward to discussions about what the new art museum can be. Mm -hmm. I'm really happy that we're gonna have these spaces. Um, I'd be happy to talk a little bit about what happened during the flood, yeah. but I'm about finished with that. <laughs> I really I don't am. Blame you. I, really I don't blame am. you. I mean, it was um, and still is extremely surreal mm -hmm. experience. Um, we, Jeff Martin, our collections manager, had a phone call from risk management oh, at the end of May saying, you know, we might, let's talk about our evacuation plan. Um, so it was, you know, we, we were already talking about it, but it wasn't until that Monday of that week that we actually had a meeting about it and decided at that point that we were going to move the collection. Unfortunately, risk management and the kind of insurance that the art museum has, which is separate from mm -hmm. any other university insurance, um, they just kind of really were able to call in the troops. Mm -hmm. So we got professional art movers from Chicago, we got conservators from Chicago, and Jeff Martin and I, Pam White was on vacation in Ireland at the time. We just kind of split up the work. I, for the first part, I focused on the staff mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and worked with the university authorities to get boxes and I, to, for staff to pack up their offices, helped helped them kind of figure out, you know, what to do, where the boxes should go, when the people were coming to pick them up, what they should pack. So I was kind of for at least part of it really focused on the staff. Mm -hmm. Jeff was in the process of kind of triaging the collection. And then I moved to the works on paper collection, which is all in one room, stored in boxes, all inventoried. And we actually, we were able to do an, a box inventory, which is incredible, and we're talking about 7,000 works of art. Oh Dale Fisher, uh, Nathan Pop, uh, Martha Yoder. There were just a number of people, employees of the museum, uh, that worked on this whole system of going through these boxes, doing an inventory. And then I had rented two trucks from Motorpool, parked them on the north end of the museum. We packed these archival boxes uh, into bigger brown boxes, put them in this van, and I drove 
across uh, town, over the Pentecrest, I mean, on the lawn to the old Capitol building, unloaded these boxes, and we kept that part of the collection in old Capitol because they had the temperature and humidity control while the huge trucks came to the loading dock and, and the m big paintings and the really important works of art were moved, were moved mm -hmm. out um, until um, Friday, we thought we'd have to leave. We were told we'd have to leave about 5.30 and it's 7 a.m. I had actually come in about six and I couldn't get any closer than kind of behind Paul's and mm -hmm. I was started to walk in towards the museum and Pam White, who was back by that time, had called and said, they're kicking us out now. But people had enough experience, um, Steve Erickson, Jeff Martin, um, to to tell the people who had stayed overnight because some had that night and other nights to move the objects that were left in the museum because there were some left up on mm -hmm. higher shelves mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then we had to leave. Wow, and I think that's I think there's kind of an untold story with um, I mean we saw everything happen and it was so quick and it was you know it happened and, and then it was kind of okay now what do we do and I think that kind of untold story of all the work it took for the museum and for the art, especially the arts campus that was so affected, to come together and try to really salvage what they could. I mean, I th if the flood had happened when school was, was still in session, um, I think what, there would have been many more people mm -hmm. uh, on campus to, to help, but mm -hmm. the faculty was, was gone. A lot of them were gone mm -hmm. by this time, and so um, you know, people lost, as you know, so much in the other art campus buildings mm -hmm. in terms of their creative tools. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've heard of lost slides that those images are gone forever. Mm -hmm. You know, all kinds yeah. of sheet music and uh, all kinds of other uh, work, mm -hmm. uh, research work, um, student work that was lost. And yeah, so it's really heartbreaking to, to see, hear those kind of stories. But now you had, you talked about looking forward now. It's looking forward time. So what do you see it, it for the future, and what, what do you hope to see now in the next six months and the following years? Well, uh, our collection is completely moving to the Figgy, uh, and that process has just started. So we've got these 22 paintings installed, uh, and it's, as I mentioned, going to be open on April 19th. We're going to be able to rotate other of our great paintings um, into this gallery as time goes on. We're looking at traveling the collection oh, nationally great. and internationally, similarly to how the Walker Art Center traveled. Travel There's and many other museums do if they have a big mm -hmm. building project. Um, and we're starting to kind of look at that um, as a possibility. I mean, it, it enables you then to get um, you know, a lot of attention, obviously, especially if we, and I'm hoping, hopeful that we will build a new art museum. Mm -hmm. And um, that, you know, the act of traveling your um, remarkable, unique collection, you know, which is, uh, you know, as remarkable as any other thing on definitely, campus. Definitely. Um, and getting that word out and getting the support for a new museum. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. I think that we're all really the staff of the museum. In fact, we were, you know, meeting and talking about it a little bit this morning. You know, are just really kind of gearing up for that. Great, great. Uh, well, we're just about out of time. Do you have anything else you want to talk about with the collections here that you have shown marvelous images of some of the work that you have helped bring into the museum collection and and kind of the the forward progress that's going to be made in the next year? Do you have anything else you'd like to add about? Your well, I here? just, um, you know, feel that all of those on the arts campus and, and the work that you're doing to support uh, the arts um, here at the university, we're all, you know, ready for these new buildings to happen. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. um, we know there's a, um, you know, the tough nut of the economy, but we still 
you know, really have very positive feelings about, about the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it's great to see that um, the community feel and kind of this, this saving grace of keeping these arts alive. And, and now that they're back in, back in Iowa from Chicago and they can be seen by other communities around, around the area. So that'll be fantastic. So thank you for joining us today again. Thanks, I appreciate Aaron. you being here. I enjoyed myself. Oh, thank, thank you, you so very much. much. Um, thank you for joining us again for an episode of Women at Iowa. We'll see you next time.